you would turn your Bible to Ephesians chapter 3. Thank you, Stephen, worship band and team for preparing us for worship in the Word. Again, thank you for continuing to, to minister to us in this very difficult season of loss in my family. Uh, you have been a great comfort to me. The Lord has comforted you or comforted me through you. And I want you also, if you're not aware, to be praying for the Butchel family. Uh, Jerry and Dolly lost their precious grandson uh, Friday uh, in his late 20s. And so please be praying for the Butchel family in this really difficult uh, and dark time. Well, if you'll look with me in Ephesians 3, we come to really a transition point in the letter. Paul has been describing God's love for us in his achievement in his son, Jesus Christ. And unlike many today who see God's love as a kind of uh, license to sin, okay, because they only consider that one attribute, Paul recognizes there are responsibilities that come with having that kind of love. That's Ephesians 4 to 6. And so he is now going to pray as we prepare ourselves for the commands that are coming. You could say the house responsibilities for being in this family, uh, adopted joint heirs with Christ because of what uh, Jesus has done for us in reconciling us to God the Father. So here's the prayer of transition preparing us for the 39 commands that are going to follow in Ephesians 4 to 6. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, that is our prayer this morning, that we would grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love. May this sermon, may this word so permeate our, our hearts that we would come to a deeper understanding of this love today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. D.A. Carson, in his wonderful book, A Call to Spiritual Reformation, tells of his colleague at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in, in Illinois, whose name was Perry Downs. Perry and his wife, Sandy, had a ministry of foster care, and they would take in, in fact, at, at the time of the writing, they had taken in over 20 newborns, and they would care and for and love these newborns until these newborns were placed into homes that had adopted them. But one day, the agency they worked for called them and asked for a new kind of uh, need from them, a new request. Uh, they asked the Downs if they would take in twin 18-month-old boys. 
And because that had not been their ministry prior to that, they, they took in newborns as a, as a norm. Uh, they were kind of reluctant, but they agreed finally when the agency said, you'll only have to keep them for six weeks. Well, the first night, the twins were there. They put them down in their room, and then Perry noticed he hadn't heard a sound from them for 30 minutes, and, and, and it surprised him. These twin boys in a new home, 18 months old, and so he crept into the room, and he noticed that their pillows were absolutely flooded with tears, but they weren't making a sound. They were wide awake. Turns out, these 18-month-old twins had been beaten for crying in several of the homes where they had been fostered prior to that point. The Downs home was the ninth home these twins had been in. And the testing revealed that they had been horribly damaged emotionally and intellectually. Well, the twins ended up living with the Downs for close to two years. And by the time they were adopted, the testing revealed a normal range of intellectual and emotional maturity. What had happened? Well, these boys had experienced the love of parents, and it had literally matured them. The same is true spiritually, absolutely the case. Just as a human cannot enjoy healthy maturation without disciplined love in the home, so also a Christian who doesn't grow in the experience of God's love in Jesus Christ will not and cannot grow into Christian and spiritual maturity. And given the exalted role of Christ's church in God's plan, we saw this last week, his intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God would be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This is God's plan for the church in his ultimate plan to sum up all things in Jesus Christ. Given this exalted role for the church, Christian maturity is absolutely critical, and hence this prayer. Now, the first thing we see about this prayer is the addressee. It is the Father. The addressee, the Father. We see this in verse 14. He says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth is named. Now, you'll remember... Um, he was about to pray in verse 1 of chapter 3, for this reason. And then he kind of goes on a, on a digression, a, an inspired digression, which has benefited Christ's church for 2,000 years. Now he's back to praying. As we saw, Paul is overwhelmed by the reality of God's plan, which is to, to bring back to the main point for which he created everything in heaven and on earth in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is going to restore all things back to the point for which he, God created them. Animate and inanimate creation. He, he, he's considered how he's going to do it through a cross and through a resurrection and, and through an exaltation where he places all things underneath the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's also a progressive triumph. You have that definitive triumph in the cross and in the ascension of Jesus, but now there's a progressive triumph that will come through Christ's redeemed new creation people, the church. He fills the church who will feel all in all. Paul is overwhelmed with that reality, but in order for us, the church, to be all that God has purposed us to be, we need, as we're going to see, power. We need love. We need to experience that love. We need Christian maturity, and hence his prayer. Now, Paul's prayers are 
directed, in fact, always directed to the Father. That's no way to say that he sees the Son and the Spirit as inferior to the Father. There's just an order of things in the Godhead. And so the, the Paul comes to the Father through the Son and through the achievement of the Son, because it's the Son who makes us fit to come into the presence of God, right? So fa- uh, Paul comes to the Father through the Son and, and by the Holy Spirit. In fact, this is a very Trinitarian prayer. Notice, he comes to the Father, but we're going to see in verse 16, he prays that we will be strengthened by the Spirit, and then in verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts. So Paul holds to a strong Trinitarian theology. And here's what I would submit to you. The more we meditate on this triune God who has revealed us to us, who has been revealed to us in Scripture and supremely in the Son of God, the more we'll be compelled to pray. In fact, we could say prayerlessness is a symptom of ignorance of God. Prayerlessness is a symptom of ignorance of God. And and this God, notice it says here, names every family in heaven, which is probably referring to the angelic realm, and every family on earth, which is likely referring to humanity. Now, why does that matter, that he names every family? In the ancient Near East, the one who had naming rights has all authority. So Paul is reminding us, the reader, that as he comes to God the Father, who has named every family in heaven and on earth, he is coming to the one who has all authority. Think about this at the human level. If you have a need and you know a human who has all authority in an area of your need, you will burn up that person's cell phone because you know this person has the authority, has the capacity, all capacity to change things, to meet my need. And so Paul is reminding us here, this God has all authority. And and in light of that, Paul is going to pray three things to this God, our Father, by adopting grace. He's going to pray this for the Ephesian church. But because this is a canonical letter, you could say this is a prayer for Christ's church of all ages. And the first thing we see here, now now we see the addressee in verses uh, 14 and 15, we see the appeal starting in verse 16. And there are going to be three requests in this appeal. The first is a prayer to be strengthened by God's power. A prayer to be strengthened by God's power. Notice with me in verse 16. He says, that according to the riches of his glory. Whose glory? The Father's glory. That's who he's praying to. He may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Now, I want you to know Paul's prayer appeals to the riches of the Father's glory. Now, what is this? Well, it refers to all that God the Father has secured for us on account of the finished work of Jesus. This is made clearer in Philippians, which was written around the same time. Both both the Philippians and Ephesians were prison epistles. In Philippians 4.19, Paul said, My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So we know that these riches in glory come to us in Jesus Christ and what he has purchased for us. Jesus has won our pardon. Jesus has reconciled us 
to God. He has canceled our sin. In him, Paul says, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Jesus has secured the gift of the Holy Spirit for us. Paul says, having believed, you're marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. And as we saw in verse 6 of our chapter here, Jesus has achieved a reconciliation such that we can now be called fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise with the Jewish believers, notice, in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And so as we read this prayer, keep in mind this is one reason why Paul asks God for this transforming power. He's praying for this power. He is persuaded the supply is as extensive as the benefit secured for us by the cross and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. But our self-centeredness, our egocentrism, our self-love is so deeply woven in the fabric of our sinful being, it takes nothing but nothing less than the power of God to transform us. The power to act holy, to think righteous thoughts, to say words of edification, Ephesians 4.29, to, to act in ways pleasing to God. And by nature, let's be honest, by nature we tend to think we are sufficient in and of ourselves. That's why it's so hard for us to read our Bibles. Uh, that is a symptom of self-sufficiency. Uh, when you are having a hard time opening up your Bible, you are essentially saying, I don't need a word from God. I can do it myself. When I have a hard time getting on my knees to pray, I am saying, I don't need your resources. I'm good in and of myself. But the scripture consistently tells us and reminds us that the power to serve God and defeat sin in our lives is a supernatural power. It's the power that raised Christ from the dead, Ephesians 1, 19 and 20. So, for instance, elsewhere in Paul's writings, 1 Timothy 1, 12, he says, I, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord. 2 Timothy 2, where he's, he's in his last days in the maritime prison, and he says to Timothy, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So he's got final words he's given to his, his protege. And what does he say? He said, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Later in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. The Christian life is a life of supernatural power. That's what it is. In fact, notice this verb form that... He says, he prays, and he, he says that you may uh, be strengthened with power. It's in the passive uh, form. It's a passive voice, which, which means it's not something that I do. It's something that is done for me. And that's driven home by these three crucial phrases. Notice, with power, that you would be strengthened with power, that's resurrection power. It's remarkable that we have resurrection power. Uh, that's not power to bench press 750 pounds if that's what you want. It's not power to get wealthy, as the health, wealth, and prosperity teachers would have us believe, or power to, to stay away from sickness. That's not it. It's the power to live in a manner that glorifies God. It's the power to love that person that drives you crazy. That, that's the power he's talking about here. It's resurrection power. And notice, it's through his spirit. It is the Holy Spirit. Now, all three persons of the Godhead are involved in, in creation, in revelation, and in salvation, and in the Christian life. But Paul says, uniquely, it is the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within you. Notice, that's why he'll say later in chapter 5, be filled with the Spirit. It is the Spirit who, who is the agent who carries this out. And notice, 
It's in your inner being. That's the location. The location where God's power is demonstrated by his spirit, Paul says, is in your inner being. So God, the Holy Spirit, does this in us. Now, I think we get a clearer picture of what he means here when he uses the same expression in 2 Corinthians 4, 16. There, Paul writes, So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. So we see the same exact language here, same expression here. He says, though our outer self is wasting away, that is our physical bodies, our inner self, that is the inner person that Paul is describing here, is being renewed day by day. So the inner self is exactly the same expression that we see in 2 Corinthians 4 that we see uh, in verse 16 of that passage. So for Paul, there's two aspects to humanity. You have the outer self and the inner self. Now, we're not Gnostics. The outer self is important. It's, in fact, our bodies are going to be raised from the grave one day. And what we do in the body today matters. But in our Western 21st century world, we tend to put more emphasis on the outer self than on the inner self. But Paul reminds us, if we have to be reminded, the outer self is wasting away. Uh, it's aging. It's falling apart. The other day, I was walking stairs, and all of a sudden, I felt compelled to go have knee surgery. And I hadn't injured my knee. It was just the fact that I'm 52. The outer self is wasting away. And Paul is saying, I, I want your inner person, your inner self, to be so strengthened and so conformed to Christ that when all your bodily strength is gone, when your body has completely had it, there is a soul left fully conformed to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why you'll see something remarkable in the church today. People, older saints, whose bodies are barely making it, but their inner selves are as strong as anything you have ever seen. They're, they're kind, they're loving, they're servants, they're humble, and so their outer bodies have wasted away, but their inner selves are as strong as you could ever imagine in a human being. And it's our souls here, Paul is referring to here, our inner selves, our hearts, conformed to the Lord Jesus Christ that is absolutely prerequisite for something vital. And that brings us to verse 17. He says... I pray that you would be strengthened through his spirit in your inner being. Notice, so. But that tells us there's a prerequisite that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, it seems a bit odd at face value that he's praying this for believers. I mean, doesn't Jesus, by his spirit, take up residence? In every believer, the moment you believe, that's what John 14 tends to indicate. Well, the key to understanding this is in that verb, to dwell, that Christ may dwell. That means literally to take up residence, to take up permanent residence. I think a helpful analogy here. Let's consider a young couple, newlyweds, who purchase a broken down fixer upper of a home. Everything about the home needs fixing. There's leaks, there's the need for new carpet, uh, air flows through the windows and every other crevice. Uh, everything about the, the, this fixer upper needs fixing. And, and so as years go by, this couple renovates. 
And after 25 years, the husband says to the wife, you know, I really like it here. I really do. I like it here. It, it, it suits us. Everywhere we look, we see the results of our work. We see the results of our renovation. This house has been shaped to fit our preferences. It has been renovated in a way where we feel comfortable living here. When Jesus, by his spirit, takes up residence in us, he finds the moral equivalence of a fixer-upper, okay? That's the reality of every sinner who repents of sin and comes to Christ by faith. But then he goes about the work of transforming that place, that space, in, into a place right for him, a place where Jesus is comfortable to dwell, all right? After all, when, when people take up long-term residence anywhere, their presence will increasingly characterize that place. Isn't that correct? Jesus' controlling presence will increasingly take over a believer's attitudes, a believer's motivations and aspirations and loves and thoughts and words. But again, when Jesus first takes up residence in that place, he finds it in bad condition. That's the, that's the case with every new believer. And that's why Paul here is praying for power because it takes nothing less than resurrection power to change our rebellious hearts and to work faith in us. Indeed, notice he says, it is Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Faith is the means by which this indwelling is attained. The, the active faith, may I even say desperate faith, of a believer, a, a faith in the love of God, the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, our faith is like a muscle. Some people tend to think that faith is something you either have or you, you don't have. Well, that's, in one sense, that's true. But in a very real sense, there are some people who have weaker faith and some people that have stronger faith. And so faith is like a muscle. And Paul seems to be saying the stronger your faith is, the more capacity you have to experience the indwelling presence of Christ. You might even say that Christ will become increasingly more comfortable in the life of someone whose faith is being strengthened. So in that case, Charles Hodges is correct when he said the indwelling of Christ is a thing of degrees. The indwelling of Christ is a thing of degrees. When you're first converted, he, he comes in to indwell you, but as your faith grows, the degree to which he indwells also grows. But in addition to praying for strengthening, Paul's second request, building on this nest, you could almost see it like it's a staircase where he's, he's climbing stairs. He goes from power to the love of Christ. The second request that he makes here is, is a prayer to understand God's love in Jesus Christ. Notice with me in the second part of verse 17. He says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that, so again, one is building on the next, that you, being rooted and grounded in love. Now, let me just say here before we move on, uh, rooted and grounded. Uh, rooted is an agricultural term, and grounded is an architectural term. Now, let me just say this. There have been a lot of theologians through the ages. So, for instance, Jonathan Edwards, who taught us that everything in creation is intended to preach God's glory. And so when God created, he didn't do it arbitrarily. 
Everything in the created order is intended to serve as a sign glory of something about who God is and what he is going to accomplish for us in his son, Jesus Christ. And so when Paul uses this language of being rooted from the agricultural world, he's assuming we have some kind of cultural competency there. And when he uses this word of being grounded from the architectural world, he's assuming we have some kind of cultural competency competency there and that we can glean from those two worlds to teach us something of the nature of what he's saying. So this week I looked up what is the tree? What tree has the deepest roots in the world? And that tree is called the shepherd's tree in the Kalahari Desert. Now I want you to think about something. The Kalahari Desert, Kalahari means waterless. That gives you some insight into that kind of the desert and, and the kind of uh, extreme conditions uh, for plant life and tree life in the Kalahari Desert. But there's a shepherd's tree that thrives in the Kalahari Desert. And its roots, get this, are 230 feet deep. That equates to 23 stories this normal looking tree, the shepherd's tree, in order for it to survive waterless conditions in a desert, has roots that go down 23 stories. Paul is saying we are rooted in God's love. But then he says we're grounded. And so I looked up the tallest skyscraper. Of course, I already knew this, but I'd forgotten the name, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. The Burj Khalifa in Dubai is over a half a mile tall. It's incredible. It's 160 stories high. And this skyscraper has a foundation that is 16 stories deep. Below the surface, the foundation of this skyscraper is 16 stories, 160 feet deep. And Paul is drawing from these, these analogies that are pale reflections of the rootedness and the groundedness that we have in the love of God. The love of God. It's what roots us. It's what grounds us. You know what that means? It keeps us stable. It keeps us secure it keeps us strong. He's not talking about our love for him, thankfully, because our love for him waxes and wanes, doesn't it? There's not a single person in here that will not repent for your uh, weak love when you see him face to face. This is not referring to our love for him, as important as that is. This is referring to God's love for us. And Paul says, it roots us, it grounds us. Indeed, it strengthens us. Notice in verse 18, he says, that we may have strength, that you being rooted and grounded in love, this is God's love in Jesus Christ, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, and height and depth, and to know, and to know, he says, the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Now, he makes a couple of intriguing points here. To comprehend how wide and long and high and deep God's love is requires corporate life. Where do I get that? He says, with all the saints. It's a corporate endeavor. That's in verse 18. In other words, the love of God isn't just expressed vertically. It certainly is. But God's love is expressed also horizontally through God's people. So let me ask you a question. When you were reaching out to me and loving my family through the morning of my mother's death with cards and calls and in emails and text, do you think I was just saying, 
Those people love me. Yeah, I was saying that. I was also saying God loves me. God loves me. He's reminding me how much he loves me by these expressions of love from the saints. Paul is saying to comprehend the love of God is a corporate endeavor. But I want you to notice as well, there's some ironic language here. He says it's a, it's a love. He, wa- he wants you to know and comprehend a love that surpasses knowledge. Now, what in the world does he mean there? Well, I think essentially what he means there is that it's a love that would require eternity to skim the surface of. It's not that you can't know it. It's not that you can't enjoy it. You'll just never exhaust it. It surpasses knowledge because we're finite and it's an infinite love. Let me give you this illustration again, going back to the fact that God has revealed himself in the created order in some way to serve as a sign glory for who he is and what he's done for us. The deepest part of the ocean is known by scientists as the Challenger Deep Gorge in the Great Mariana Trench in the Northwest Pacific Ocean. Get this, the deepest place in the ocean, in that area, is seven miles deep. One mile longer than Mount Everest is tall. Mount Everest is six miles tall, and the depth of this ocean is seven miles deep. We do not have technology to get down there. we, We just can't do it. We cannot explore the depths of the ocean. And yet, we can still benefit from the ocean. We can still enjoy the ocean. We do, don't we? We we can still be in awe of the ocean. We can marvel. And, And we can learn more and more about the ocean, but we will never be able to explore the depths of the ocean And maybe the ocean is the strongest analogy, and yet it even falls short of God's love in Jesus Christ, which is an infinite love. But the second part of verse 19 makes clear that the more we learn about this love, the more something critical happens. All right? So there's a staircase that we're climbing. One step leads to the next. Strength and power to apprehending the love of God in Jesus Christ. That brings us to the third prayer that Paul prays in this section, a prayer to be filled with God's fullness. That's just remarkable. Notice in the second part of verse 19, he says, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, notice that. Notice how many words that is found. So there are prerequisites that lead to the next thing that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That is a remarkable statement, especially if you are steeped in Old Testament theology. You see, in the Old Testament, God's presence dwelt in the Garden of Eden, His unique special revelatory presence. It dwelt in the tabernacle. We saw that in our study of Exodus. And it dwelt uniquely in the temple. Now Paul has already reminded us the church is the temple of God. And because of the finished work of Jesus making us fit to enter the presence of God, we, we are the holy of holies. And he's praying that God would dwell. But, but what exactly does this mean? Well, I think it is one of those truths that go beyond anything we could ever fully understand. But if you'll notice over in chapter 4, just real quickly, look in verse four, uh, chapter 4, verse 13. Paul gives us a little more insight to what this means, being filled with the measure of the fullness of God. He says that, that, that Jesus has given the church teachers, pastors and teachers, he says, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Notice, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God 
to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So there he uses the same language. We're filled with the fullness of God in Jesus Christ, and he equates that to spiritual maturity, mature manhood. Consider Galatians 4, 19. We looked at this several years ago when Paul says, My little children, for whom I am in the anguish of childbirth, until Christ be formed in you. And so being filled with the measure of the fullness of God in Jesus Christ is synonymous with Christian maturity. Paul understands we cannot be spiritually mature unless we receive power from God to enable us to grasp the love of Jesus Christ. This whole prayer is connected to itself. Now, we may think we're mature because we love theology. I'm closing out my 15th year of teaching at Boys College, and I spent nine years full-time seminary student. This was me at one time. And it's a whole lot of students I meet today. They, they believe because they have this new love for theology that exceeds anybody else's love that they know that they're, they're spiritually mature. Or there may be people who just listen to 10 sermons a day and they equate listening to uh, you know, their favorite preachers with spiritual maturity. Or maybe it's someone who just is, is zealous for truth zealous for orthodoxy, what Herman Bobbitt calls orthodoxism. Or they're just faithful in church attendance. Every time the door is open, they're there, and they've been that way for 50 years, and they equate that with spiritual maturity. Now, all of those things are good, but that's not, Paul says, the, the real and sure evidence of spiritual maturity. He knows we can't be mature until we know this love that surpasses knowledge. And that's what he's praying for here. And now at the close of this prayer, he's going to break out in doxology. And, and here's why. He knows as he prays this prayer, God is able to answer it. You know, when I read this prayer... I, I just come to this haunting sense of how short I fall. How I, I am pre-kindergarten in my understanding of the love of God in Christ. And, and, and sometimes I feel like there, there's so little spiritual vitality in my life. Now, it's easy for me, me to love my family, and it's easy for me to love people who love me back. But, but it is, I have been so convicted by sometimes my inability to love people who are unlovely. And yet, Paul is praying that I would have the power to do that. And, and, and now we're going to see at the end of this passage where he, he breaks out in adoration that indeed he is able to answer this prayer for every single Christian that is prayed for, for every Christian who is in Christ. Notice me in verse 20. Now to him who is able... <laughs> so if you've been like me reading this prayer going, this just does not in any way describe me, or at least it doesn't describe me as much as it should. Put it that way. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power that is at work within us. So it's not depending on me. It's depending on the power that is at work within me. Now I want you to see something here. Notice, he's able to do. We see that in verse 20. He is able to do. What does that mean? That means God the Father in the Son and by the Spirit is neither inactive or idle nor dead. He is able to do. Notice, he's able to do what we ask. He's able to do what we ask. In other words, if you're a Christian, because you have a high priest who has gone before you in the heavenlies, 
And because you have a righteousness imputed to you, the righteousness of Christ, you rest assured he hears your prayers. He absolutely hears your prayers. He's able to do what we ask. But notice as well, he's able to do what we think. (laughs) It's remarkable. In other words, he knows your thoughts. And let's be honest. There are things we think that we've never voiced to the Lord. Maybe we just thought it was too outlandish. There's no way God would answer that prayer. He's able not only to do what you ask, he's able to do what you think. It's remarkable. In other words, it's not dependent on the vitality of my prayer life. Praise God for that. It's on, it's dependent on the fact that our God is, what does it say? Able. He's able. Notice as well, he's able to do all. Notice that word. That's an important word. He's able to do all that we ask or think. He knows it, and he can perform it. All that we ask or that we think. And notice, he's able to do more. You didn't know there was that much in this one verse, did you? He's able to do more than all that we ask and think. We're not the ones running this thing. He does more than anything we could ask or anything we could even think. We're finite and fallible. He's able to do more. In other words, his expectations are higher than ours. I mean, I I have felt so much comfort in this one verse this week. Notice as well, he's able to do not just more, more abundantly (laughs) than all we could ask or think. He does not ration out grace. You know, you'll sometimes see these, uh, these shows about uh, these impoverished countries. God, God helped them, and they have to ration out food. And sometimes I think we think that God's grace is like that. He's able to do more abundantly than we all we could ask or think. He does not ration grace. And then finally, he's able to do far more abundantly. Paul can't get over this God. He's a God of super abundance. And as I said earlier, the more we know this God, the more we pray. The more we know this God, it also changes how we pray. It's not that we can't cast all our cares upon the Lord. We can ask him about, you know, fix, you know, if your transmission breaks down, you can... Pray about that. If you have a sinus infection, you can pray about that. But the more you know this God, it absolutely changes the way you pray. Paul is concerned about ultimate things here. It's a sign of Christian maturity. And notice he says, here's why I'm praying. Because in the end, it's about his glory. Notice, to him be glory in the church. That's the body of Christ. And in Christ Jesus, that's the head of the body through all generations. That is, to him be glory through the church and in Christ Jesus in history. And then he says, forever and ever in eternity as well. God is going to get the glory in history and through all eternity through his church And in Christ Jesus, and with that, Paul prays, Amen. Amen. Literally, let it be so. Indeed, let it be so. At Fisherville, you know, Perry and Sandy Downs, their love, which is remarkable love, was still imperfect and temporal. And yet that imperfect And that temporal love had a profound effect on those twin boys. The love of God in Jesus Christ, it changes everything.